And that was kind of the, the final piece of the puzzle for a lot of my patients that were uh, struggling with that. You're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast, where we believe that your health is the number one resource you need to accomplish your dreams. My name is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and I'm a physician dedicated to helping my patients maintain their active lifestyle and continue doing what they love. I'm sitting down with other experts so that we can provide our listeners with the knowledge they need to improve their health and live their best life. Hey, everyone. This is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and you're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast. In the last episode, I talked about how one of the things that I absolutely love doing is learning about new sports, learning about new, just new things in general. Uh, and I have this curiosity about you know different topics, and and that that really drives me into want to learn more about uh, you know a number of different things. And In one of my uh, recent cravings for wanting to learn something in medicine, I wanted to actually learn more about, you know, how to treat hands, how to treat shoulders, different things like that. Through that research, I came across the topic of climbers and the injuries that climbers uh, can sustain. And one of the things that I wanted to do was learn more about this. And so I brought in Dr. Michelle Snow, who is a climbing and outdoor enthusiast and owner of Ascend Chiropractic uh, for this series. And so uh, in this series, we're talking about uh, you know, a number of different injuries that are related to climbers and how Dr. Snow actually goes about and treats them. Uh, so Dr. Snow, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. In this episode, Dr. Snow is going to dive into treating shoulder and thoracic or upper back uh, injuries and uh, is going to answer the question of what can lead to some of those injuries and some things that you can do at home to prevent them. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Snow works with uh, with a number of climbers. Uh, she herself is a, is a climber and, uh, and loves to boulder at a, a local gym uh, just down the street from my office here. Let's get into it, and uh, you know we uh, we're talking about shoulder and upper back uh, injuries. What is it that is important for individuals to understand about uh, the shoulder and upper back? The in your opinion, the shoulder is a very complex part of the body. Uh, it's a junction point between the trunk or the upper back, um, and down into the arm. So there's a lot of muscles, joints, ligaments, tendons, nerves, blood vessels, you name it. They run right in that region, and all of which can be injured potentially uh, or cause issues down the line. So it's an area that has a lot going on um, and one that typically we see needs to be more stable overall um, to protect all those structures and help prevent injury from happening. So um, with that, a lot of times I see there's decreased motion or restriction um, in one part of the body, and then another part of the body has to compensate for that loss of movement. So in this region of the body, the upper back typically will be restricted or lose motion um, in that upper back region. And so to do uh, extension in that area or when you're reaching out with your arm, your shoulder has to compensate for that lack of movement in the upper back. So that's something that I see pretty commonly um, and what we're going to dive deeper into in this episode because um, it's something that's can be a pretty simple fix and easily preventable for the most part um, to keep you climbing or doing your activities that you love. So shoulders complex, upper back is complex as well. Yeah. What is it that, or what, what's, you know, at, at the end of the day, injuries to this area is usually a, a, an effect of something, right? So what, what is the, the common cause that you see? Like what, what, what are some of the things that people can assess in themselves to, to, you know, to prevent these injuries from occurring? Um, and then we could talk about treatment and stuff, but what, what is it that you typically see the, the main cause to be for, for injuries in this area? Typically what I see um, is related to posture. So for the example of climbers, uh, climbers' posture, if you look at them, For the most part, they have rounded forward shoulders, um, their pec muscles are tight, 
Uh, the top upper back is is rounded forward as well, almost in like a, a hump kind of positioning. So with that, um, you pull everything forward and it gets tight and restricted. Um, those tight pec muscles can start to push on the nerves and all the other structures that are underneath it that travel down into the arm and into the hand. With that as well, when those shoulders are pulled forward, it restricts the extension of your upper back. So you're less likely to be able to strengthen those muscles that are supposed to pull the the whole shoulder and the back um, backwards okay. into that extended position. Okay. So being slouched over all the time at your desk, you know, that essentially is what that translates exactly. to as well. Right? It's it's the same thing. It's just a different application. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so your your slouch forward, your shoulders are rolled forward. That weakens muscles in the back. That affects uh, upper back extension, as you mentioned. Can cause shoulder pain. Can cause neck pain. I would imagine. Yep. Right? Exactly. Okay. When that does occur, and and you have your you know shoulders rolled forward, uh, your upper back is is kind of slouched over. Does your shoulder or does does your body compensate in any way to to try and improve that and you know and does that lead to more of a problem or is that you know is there a compensation pattern that's actually good for that uh i would say well in general compensation patterns aren't great thing, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because um it's basically taking the body out of its uh, optimal position where it's designed to function at its best so yes you can function day to day and get through certain movements or activities in that way. But what uh, it leads to is over time, you may get aggravation of certain areas or structures and it can lead to different overuse injuries. You know, a common overuse injury you see or hear about is like tennis elbow um, Mm -hmm. or golfer's elbow. So similar thing, it, it irritates those tendons or those structures underlying because that area of the body is having to compensate for a lack of movement in another part of the body. Okay. And then how about uh, injuries to the shoulder itself? I, I would imagine having it rolled forward, what are some of the consequences that can happen with that? So with the, in general, with the shoulders pulled forward, um, again, it restricts the movement in the upper back. Mm-hmm. So your whole shoulder has to compensate for that movement. And that plays especially in the climbing world, um, into any sort of reaching movement. If you're doing a big reach and trying to bring your arm backwards um, to get onto a different hold in the route you're working on, it can pull on those structures. You can run the risk of tearing some of your pec muscles, but a lot of times you see uh, the compensation is like the overuse injuries or the tears of the rotator cuff um, and just aggravation and inflammation in that whole shoulder area. Okay. Yeah. Which is not fun because then no. that, that would, uh, that would affect your ability to reach or lift your arm above, you know, the 90 degree mark, all that other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So just reaching for something at a high shelf isn't possible at that point or it would hurt at least. Yep. Yeah. So not only does it affect your ability to do the activities that you want, like climbing, um, but also you quickly realize if you have an injury like that, that how much you use that area of your body to do your day-to-day activities and tasks, um, even lifting your arm up to brush your teeth, something like that, or put your hair in a ponytail or something. So uh, you learn real quick what each muscle is meant to do when you're not able to use it uh, uh, properly. That's a good learning experience, I would imagine, but an unfortunate one with that. Yep, definitely. Uh, So when, you know, all the times that my mom said to, you know, sit up straight and not slouch, that that was a... She was essentially helping me prevent these from occurring, right? Yep. (laughs) Yeah, and honestly, we see this sort of posture a lot. And like you mentioned before, it it is a lot related to uh, desk posture or just technology use in general. Um, A lot of times our shoulders are rolled forward. We're looking down at a phone or a computer, uh, and our, our desk situations just aren't set up well for our ergonomics or our body um, alignment and setup. So it's not just present in that posture in climbers, but 
in a lot of people in their day-to-day lives and their nine-to-five jobs. Um, If you combine the two, if you work (laughs) nine-to-five at a computer job all day long, but you're an avid climber and you climb at the end of your day in the gym, you're, you know, fueling the fire on both ends with that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the entire time during this podcast, dude, uh, I I will know Dr. Snow has had, like, perfect posture, and I'm, like, trying to match her this entire time (laughs) because I'm not— I noticed I was slouching when we were talking about this. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> no, and that's that's funny um, that you say that because it's something that as soon as someone hears me or a group of people I'm talking to say that I'm a chiropractor, I take notice. Everyone always corrects their posture. So it's something <laughs> that's funny for me to witness in my day-to-day world. Yeah, absolutely. So and for, for other individuals who are like me that may slouch during the day, what, what are some things that we could be doing to help address – our poor posture, essentially, obviously correcting it, but correcting it's going to be going to be one thing. But I've already done damage by being slouched over for a good majority of the day. So what are some things yeah. that I could be doing to help myself and prevent shoulder, upper back injuries from recurring down the road? So correcting posture overall um, is a step by step process. It's something that takes time and practice. Uh, it's something you have to bring to mind or your your consciousness um, regularly, so you get into the practice of it, um, and it becomes more natural. But first things first, targeting those tight pec muscles is the thing that I like to do um, because no matter how much you focus on the back, if you're trying to strengthen those muscles to pull your shoulders back, if the pec muscles are tight, it's just going to hold you in that forward shoulder rolled position. Your back muscles aren't going to be able to fight that position. So first stretching out those tight pec muscles. Uh, And then once you do that, uh, you can start to strengthen the back muscles. So primarily the rhomboids and um, the lat muscles. So those will help you. The rhomboids help bring those shoulder blades back. And then the lat muscles help bring the shoulder blades down um, away from your ears. So those are the two best muscle groups to target to help correct these issues. So again, target those pec muscles first, then start to strengthen the back muscles, the rhomboids and the lats. And then in my office day to day, I typically teach a lot of these exercises to my patients um, because it's very important to have the patient have an active role in their care. It makes it a lot more sustainable and effective um, and also gives them tools in their toolbox. So they can do these things on their own. If they start to have an aggravated uh, shoulder or issue down the line, they can start with these uh, to see if they can help maintain it and, and just decrease that pain uh, without immediately coming into me. Or I have some patients who compete and travel around the world. So if they're in Japan and I'm not there with yeah. them, you know, they have to have something that they can do in the meantime before they travel back home and can get treated. So that's something that's very important uh, to teach and give them as a tool that they can have. It's also very empowering for the patient to have that ownership of their health. And then I also do some specified muscle work Mm -hmm. in my office. So again, targeting those pec muscles um, is usually what I'll do and adjusting. So the chiropractic adjustment with this area in in these issues in specific, uh, I adjust the thoracic spine, so the mid to upper back, and I feel for areas that are not extending well mm-hmm. relative to the joints above and below it for that particular person because everyone has their own kind of baseline of how their joints feel and move. Yeah. Um, and then adjusting the ribs as well. That's a big one because the ribs sit underneath the scapula, the shoulder blade, Uh, And sometimes if they are not moving well and not extending well, it can both affect the the mid to upper back because it connects from that and wraps around to the front of the chest. Um, But it can also help cause the decrease in motion of the shoulder blade, um, which then affects the whole shoulder complex. Right. Well, and and the AC joint, correct, as well. Like it, it, it can impact that as well. Yep. I, I know we had a, uh, a mutual patient that uh, I was treating their AC joint for uh, ligament laxity and then it got better. And then a little bit of that 
pain was coming back. And then fortunately you, you were able to adjust the rib and that, that fixed it. So it was just an issue with, you know, a rib being out of place and affecting the scapula, I would imagine. Yep, exactly. So it's all interconnected. And that's why, again, it's a, a very complex area. Um, so, you know, if something's not moving in the mid to upper back. It might be relating to or causing an issue with one of the ribs, which could be connected to the shoulder blade, which can play into the humerus um, or the clavicle. Uh, the clavicles actually can be adjusted as well. Okay. It's something that Tell on, me more about this. Yeah. yeah, it's something that not a lot of people know about, and not every chiropractor does it. Uh-huh. Um, but I found, especially in the climbing community, that if the clavicle isn't rotating, which is it's one of the primary movements of it. Um, it's very little movement that the clavicle does, but if it's not rotating correctly, it can restrict some of the shoulder movement, especially with um, internal rotation of okay. the shoulder. Okay. So if I usually I, I look at the other joints, the ribs, um, how everything else is moving, and feel the muscles around the shoulder. And, you know, release some of those areas, adjust the upper back. Um, But sometimes there's just a little bit that's hanging on. Yeah. And and so I started checking more into the clavicle and that rotational aspect. And that was kind of the the final piece of the puzzle for a lot of my patients that were were, uh, struggling with that. So it's pretty uh, cool to see. You can test just how far the patient's able to internally rotate their mm-hmm. shoulder beforehand. And and a lot of times if it's restricted, it'll kind of pull the shoulder up and round it forward. Okay. And then adjusting the clavicle, helping it spin, basically. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't spin all the way around, but you're just aiding the little bit of movement that it's supposed to have. And, uh, and then checking afterward that same internal rotation. And it's it decreases how much it's pulling and rotating that shoulder, um, you know, rounding it forward. And it also just allows the full internal rotation of the shoulder. So what, when, when we're looking at internal rotation, what are some movements, like everyday movements that someone might notice, you know, that like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm having trouble with this and, and it, it's an internal rotation problem. What does that look like in an everyday, like everyday life? I'd say the biggest and most common thing that we all do is is reaching behind us. You okay. know, if you're trying to reach behind your seat when you're driving in the car, yeah. bringing that shoulder, it rotates it internally. Okay. Um, so that's that's probably the biggest example. Like reaching for a wallet or something like yep. that? Okay. Yep. And then the, And then if there's a... If the clavicle is like fixated or stuck, is, is there pain when that occurs or anything like that? Or potentially, okay. um, there isn't always pain associated with it, okay. and sometimes it can just feel kind of like tight. Sometimes it can be sharp or sore, kind of painful. But a lot of times it's not super noticeable, but it causes a compensation pattern, and it's somewhere else in the shoulder or kind of upper back area that you'll start to feel that pain. Okay. Um, so it's it's kind of sneaky sometimes. Yeah. And, and people don't always know or or think to put that piece of the puzzle into it. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, yeah, I specialize in treating shoulders and I had no clue about that. <laughs> that, that is that is a new piece of information for me. Well, what, there you go. So this is why I love doing podcasts because yeah. I, I get to learn this kind of stuff. Exactly. So, okay, that's cool. And then is there, so we talked about adjusting the thoracic spine, the clavicle, scapula, ribs, stretching the pecs. Uh, can can you walk our listeners through how to go about stretching pecs and uh, or how, how else they can work the tight pecs out? Yeah. So the easiest way or the most effective way that I like to teach um, is that you stand near a wall about arm distance away and you want to put your palm against the wall with your fingers facing backwards. And then um, keeping your core engaged so that your whole torso rotates as one you're going to rotate your body away from that wall. So you'll feel a a stretch in the front of your shoulder and across um, your pec muscles and your chest. So that's the easiest way. Doing little um, pulses of that movement is helpful because it allows for the body to have a little bit of a break in between and more gradually stretches out that area. So you would um, rotate away from that wall 
for a couple seconds and then let it relax, rotating back toward the wall slightly and then rotate away again. And another thing about doing those gradual movements and stretches is the more you can implement it throughout your day-to-day life and routine, the more effective it's going to be. Um, So a lot of times I tell my patients, you know, set an alarm in your phone every hour or find some sort of activity you can associate doing this stretch with that you already do throughout your day so that you can break up your day and also just, you know, take 30 seconds to do 15 or 20 little repetitions of that stretch. It makes it a lot more effective. It is more gradual for the body to get used to. So it doesn't freak out and get aggravated in that area because you just stretched it for an hour and it hadn't been stretched ever in your life. That's awesome. Uh, no, those, those are all fantastic tips. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about the shoulder and thoracic area? I think that pretty much touches yeah. on all. I think we covered a lot. All the yeah. points. Yeah. yeah, that's. I try and keep things relatively simple and just introduce a few things, ideas uh, that my patients can latch onto because we all have enough going on in our day to day lives. <laughs> Absolutely. On the next episode uh, in in this series, we're going to have Dr. Snow back, and we're going to be talking about. Uh, injuries to the hip flexor, and then uh, also low back and how to go about preventing those. Dr. Snow, thank you once again for being on this episode. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Uh, Thanks, y'all. Thank you for listening.